Hi, Scott. How are you? I'm doing all right, Leslie. Uh, you have your Coke today? Of course I do. Do you have your coffee? You know it. All right. Well, let's get started. Sounds good. So today we're going to be talking about uh, continuing with our writing series with these bite-sized PDs, and we're going to be talking about the idea of taking laps in informational writing. Oh, it helps if I'm clicked. <laughs> <laughs> As you know, we have our professional development norms, be committed, be respectful, be responsible, be safe, take care yeah. of yourself. Yep. The other ones, I think, uh, if you are joining this live, then mute your microphone, turn your camera on if you're comfortable with that, blur your background if you want, or put yourself on a nice beach somewhere. And then um, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. We'll be happy to answer them. And I think the most important of all, especially right now, is just be kind. Yep, definitely. We have our MTSSSSSSSSSSSS framework that we always reference. Um, we tried to blow it up, but we're talking about basically instruction and following the standards. And for us, that is informative writing right now. So learning intentions and success criteria. Um, and I like that, mostly that we added rationale to this. I think this should be on every single one of them. Um, mm -hmm. But this comes straight from the 180 days book. But the rationale is that um, the more data that more data have been created in the entire two year last two years than in the entire pre. Oh my gosh, let me try that again. More data. I'm just going to paraphrase. More data has been created yeah. in the last two years than has been created in the history of the human race. And so, given that, being able to convey information to others is a skill that is increasingly valued and important for our students to be able to do um, in an information rich world. So. Given that our learning intention is today, I'm learning how to design a, a writing unit using laps of writing um, and success criteria. I can describe the three levels of laps and their purpose, and I can explain what these might look like in informative writing. Hmm. So our agenda then, or what are laps? Why are we saying laps? Um, but what are laps of writing? Uh, what might these look like in informative writing? And then we'll step back and talk about some critical questions to guide informative writing and sort of that building block that you see in almost every genre of writing, uh, but the one that's the building block for informative. And then we're going to go into three levels of laps with examples. And these are by no means comprehensive. They're just the beginning. Um, in fact, I'd love to have people share their ideas on what would be in these levels um, once they kind of get the gist of, of how these levels work. Yeah, really pooling our creative resources. Yep. So laughs in writing um, are basically a repeated exposure to a technique or a genre of writing. And we're going to use mentor text to do that, a variety of texts. We're going to do a variety of different student writing samples from very small things to larger pieces. And each lap that you take with that writing genre, this month we're talking about informative, is going to get progressively more complex. Um, the reading is going to get more complex and the student creation is going to get more complex. And we use this image of a solar system because some planets can make that lap around the sun faster than other planets. Um, and they're all spinning at different rates. So when we are talking about accelerating students or accelerating learning, students can go through these laps at different paces. And it allows for us to differentiate and to stop and reteach if we need to. I think so often when I look back at the way I used to teach writing, where I just had one essay at the end of the quarter and there was a deadline, it was really hard for me to stop and reteach in that kind of system. But by doing laps, and we'll get into more detail of what these look like, by doing laps, you have room to kind of maneuver. And I know Scott and I have brought it up a couple of times, but um, go back into the um, early out resources that we have and look at Kanban boards. And Corey did that at Eastmont and talked about it and how using Kanban boards and laps can help create writing 
that helps meet the needs of the students right where they're at, whether they're accelerated or whether they need some extra supports. And one thing I like about this graphic too um, is they're all moving in the same direction. Yes. Just at different paces. And you'll see as we go today, um, this idea of sort of immersing students in um, the genre. And I think that allows for some students to go even deeper in their immersion, so to speak, mm -hmm. than um, students who are just getting some of their first touch points with it. Yeah. All right. So I think, you know, it's, as you approach each different genre of writing, I think there are a different set of questions. And some of these questions might also be the same. And so um, these questions are, are pretty, pretty big. And I would want my students to, to see them and use them. And I'd constantly ask them these questions as we engage uh, any, anything, really any material, a piece of writing, a, a commercial, a speech, whatever it might be. But who wrote it? It's the first question, um, you know, that, that speaks to credibility, right, our ethos. Uh, who's the intended audience? How big is that? That changes everything almost based on the audience. Um, what is the purpose of this information? I wish people were asking that question a little more often right now in today's, uh, today's world of information uh, overload. Why is it presented and organized in this way? And it appears I have typoed and put a period and not a question mark. Um, what is said, and I love this question. I used to love using this question with my students, but what is not said? And kind of thinking about what is intentionally not said. What yeah, information I, am I, sorry, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. What information am I purposefully omitting so that I can inform in the way that I want to inform? Yeah, and I really like this process of critically analyzing texts, you know, being readers first and then writers. And that reading and writing really are interconnected. We can't divorce those two skills. Yeah, well said. So the kind of building blocks for information or explanatory writing is the summary and being able to write a good quality summary it shows that students understand the main idea and the important details before they can even get into analyzing. So as a quick review, last year, Scott did a Bite Size PD on strategies for summary writing. So in here, we link the video and the slides and resources. And Scott goes over summary frames, paragraph shrinking, which I th is a really cool skill uh, reporter's notes and one sentence summaries. So take a look at that because if your students are struggling with writing summaries, that's where I would start with informational writing. They need that skill to really be successful and do the more complex writing that we're going to be doing in laps two and three. So lab one is a short I consider them short bursts um, of reading and writing. And you, even though it's lap one, it should be used throughout the unit. So you're gonna do several of these throughout the unit. And the objective of doing this is to identify and communicate understanding. This is where students are going to be learning and noticing the techniques of informational writing in its wide variety of forms. And the goal is that you're going to build towards summarizing the information in uh, the writing that you're looking at. So this lab is heavy on using mentor texts. Leslie, we actually go to slide 13 and then I'll back yeah. up to 12. Yeah. Thank you. So these are, you know, these are bursts. So these are kind of those smaller, really kind of low stakes pieces where students are analyzing and they might just do a, a sentence or two, or they might just discuss, but really we want to expose them to as many different types um, of informative writing pieces uh, that we can in that genre. And so in here, we might just have them practice in their notebooks. We might have them look at photo essays, uh, informational videos, um, 
we might have them look at multiple texts and combine uh, and do a, a summary. Um, and in that uh, bite size PD on on writing summaries, it's really focused on the more simple uh, summary writing activities like um, using stems and some of the other ones that Leslie just talked about. But we also might just have our students analyze headlines, subheadlines, and really talk about the how do you locate and how do you determine the credibility of the sources. Um, one of the things that I really like is the idea of using infographics. If you go ahead and go back now. So infographics are really great because they spark interest and they're easy to read. Um, and it allows students to start the process or to get into that process of synthesizing the information and summarizing what it says. So this is where we can get them away from argument, but like, what's the, what is going on here? And so this one right here, yeah, I know I'm selling it, but it's sort of a cigarettes. How much do you know about them? And, you know, I might show this to students um, or, you know, as a dad, I might show this to my own kids <laughs> right now, but, you know, I think you could have your kids look at this and they could stare at it and go, okay, well, one in five adults and teenagers smoke. Um, tobacco smoke, 4,000 chemicals. Uh, there are 250 known to harm humans. So I could go through this right now um, and I could ask my students, you can see on the right, I try to, you know, create like a page, but what does it say and what does it not say? And so as I go through it, there are a lot of facts I might pick out and just summarize the one that stands out to me the most, but I also might summarize sort of um, what it's not saying. So for example, this is not saying where these cigarettes are made. Why not? And so we go back to those questions. And then I might want to know, well, who created the infographic? And then I might want to dig even further and see why they're showing, uh, you know, where why they're not telling us where they're made, so to speak. It's not just about all the problems with it, but who's selling these things? And so, um, and what are what are the what's the legislation that's happening? So you can see students coming up with these own questions, and that kind of builds on our inquiry. But at the end of the day, really, what I want them to do is just focus in on this and go, okay. What's going on here? Let's let's really uh, solidify that skill of summary. <clears throat> well, and when I saw this, I thought, oh, well, what about statistics on quitting smoking? And, you know, because the purpose is clearly to stop them from even starting, right? So that, you know, you talked about adding purpose. So, oh, yeah. Well, because I, I, if I were to say what I think the intent is here, which is probably a later skill since we're just at the very beginning in lab one, I, but you also said we come back to it. So maybe in lab three, we start looking at intent and yeah. their intent here is to scare. Yes. Right? So these are real, all very startling statistics so that someone who is um, thinking about potentially smoking, I guess, will immediately say, no, I don't want to do that. Right. Okay. Lap two. And so and so then you go from lap one and you move into lap two. And you'll see that we, it, it gradually gets more complex and it actually gradually releases by, by the time we get to lap three. But in lap two, we start to look at a variety of sources and we're comparing them now. And we're writing a summary based on those comparisons. Um, our objective now is to, we're moving from just identifying um, and putting it down to now we're evaluating. So what is the what's the most important piece of information on that? Not just what's a piece of information, and then we're also synthesizing. So I'm putting it together. I might uh, multiple texts, and what I'm building toward, I'm I'm enhancing that ability to summarize now and the complexity of my summaries, um, and I'm building toward integrating multiple sources in summary writing. Yeah, and. Um... <clears throat> the key skills in lap two are students are starting to read like writers. So they're really noticing the craft that writers are doing there. They can listen to informational podcasts and present information. They can recognize how language informs and how it persuades. So when we're thinking about our standards and we're thinking about um, authors intent and purpose, we're looking at uh, rhetorical triangle, all those skills that they need to be able to recognize. And then in lap three, they'll start integrating that into their own writing. They're going to find multiple sources from different perspectives. And 
I didn't put it in here, but it's also perspectives like firsthand accounts compared to news reports of the account compared to what it's like, uh, how it's discussed in history, right? Um, yep. As well as different types of sources, right? Maybe it's a video, maybe it's a podcast, maybe it's an infographic. Yeah, Scott. Oh, I'm nodding. I'm nodding oh, okay. with you. Like, oh, I was yeah. like, okay, wait, wait, keep going. <laughs> Um, and then recognizing what's withheld. So I think there's a difference in the message or the question between what's not there and what's being withheld. And that's, you don't know that until you start looking at different sources and you notice that one source purposely left out really important information, right? Why would they do that? Um, and then in their own writing, they're going to start focusing on their word choice um, as a way of conveying a message, or if we're, if they're really focusing on staying neutral. So, so oh, sorry. Nope. Go ahead, Scott. So if I'm, if I'm looking at this and I have, a, um, and you're saying words like persuade, and we're looking at a lot of this, that seems rhetorical. What, how do you explain that we're still in the informative writing arena, even though we're doing some things here that could also be in the argumentative writing arena? Ooh, great question. So inf we're doing informational writing, but as students go out and look for research on topics that they're interested in, or we're pulling in multiple sources, they might be more persuasive sources. So we have to kind of recognize the rhetoric that the writer's using and can glean out that inf information that's in it. And if you can recognize what's information and what's how the language is information or how it's persuasive, you can start to divvy that out and really get to the key facts. I think it's an important skill, you know? I'm yeah. a very avid TikTok fan. And it's interesting to see how social media, when they're talking about current topics that are happening in the world, how they use rhetoric to kind of persuade and get people riled up. And then they share the message, right? That emotion is really key. And there might be some good information in there as well, but it might also not be true. And we have to wade through the emotion and the rhetoric to get to facts and information. Perfect, love it. So that's, oh, I forgot. So we included a link to a tech set with articles from Halloween from New Zealand as an example. And you would obviously want to create your own tech set but this tech set that was um, built by a teacher is all about um, three big questions having to do with Halloween. So why do they like scary movies, Halloween candy, and scary fairies? But I think it's a good example of um, a, a less complex text in there where the topics Halloween, here are three different articles and you need to synthesize this into one summary about Halloween. And so that's a skill um, that we're building in this second lab. Does that make sense, Scott? Did I explain that right? Yeah, and, and one thing I think is, is important to note as we look at sort of these laps is the, this isn't a day or even two, like lap one might be a couple weeks. Lap yeah. two might be a couple weeks, might be three weeks. Right. right. Lap, lap three might be, a, you know, a, a whole quarter. Who knows? Yeah. But they're def these are definitely not like a one or two day thing that you do. Right. And it's not like I'm going to do one one writing piece in lap one, one in lap two. No, you're going to do multiple. Right. Because we're building capacity. Yeah. Okay. And then lap three is where you get to. I don't want to call it a final, but it's a more comprehensive writing piece. And it usually connects to a larger idea or topic. And we're calling this a writing piece. Um, and Scott's going to go over some various 
options for that writing piece real quickly, commercial news article presentation. The whole objective in lab three is that students are creating and demonstrating their understanding of informational writing. And, you know, it's building towards that extended writing piece. And I just want to like flash back to um, earlier this idea of students submitting a best draft and not a final draft, right? So whatever this writing piece is, they're going to submit their best, maybe not a final, because as we know, we can continue to improve. One thing uh, that I think we, as you move into lap three is in laps one and two, there's more of a focus on consuming and synthesizing the information. And in lap three, they're actually the creators, the content creators of the information. So as a teacher, I want to make sure, you know, that main skill is to summarize. Before I move a kid into lap three, they I, I want to be able to be sure that they know how to summarize, at least in multiple ways, with multiple different modes of um, informative uh, texts. So um, lap three, basically, uh, key skills, track your engagement, uh, what makes it effective, a text, analyze the impact of features, uh, why to put that image, headlines, music, revise language to craft the desired tone of the piece, uh, share with others, and then being able to take feedback and to revise. And I think um, throughout all of these, what I've seen is, and we'll talk about it later too, but an emphasis on collaboration, that this is not a, so, none of these are necessarily a solo effort. These are uh, rich opportunities for students and teachers and students to collaborate in groups and partners um, to really uh, use their, their speaking and their talking to, um, to analyze and sort of formulate their thinking around what's going on. Yeah, and I think it's interesting to note here, this on this slide we have analyzed twice. They're analyzing engagement or analyzing impact so that they can change their own writing, right? That's where the create piece comes on because I know that that can be a little, there, you know, connected. Right. So we were just brainstorming and we've took maybe five minutes and you could probably have this be uh, 10 pages long, but some of the things that students could use their newfound skills after laps one and two um, to create some kind of an informative piece that doesn't necessarily have to be the traditional school research paper. Um, and there's no problem if there is the annual school research paper, but if you want to break the mold a little bit and try something, um, you know, that that might mirror what inf in the informational texts that are out there. A uh, photo essay, um, having students create a mini documentary, um, a campus tour brochure, uh, especially if I'm an outgoing eighth grader and I could build that for my incoming uh, sixth graders, or if I'm an outgoing senior and I'm building that for my incoming freshmen. Um, you've been studying infographics like crazy now, probably for four or five weeks, go create one. Do the research, figure out where the what the data says. Um, do a feature article. Of course, there's informative essay in there. Um, having a passion project. Uh, you know, we all have our passions. You know, we all know Leslie. Um, Leslie's got her passions. I've got my passions, and so maybe I we dive deep into those. Um, build a website, and then Leslie, I'm turning over the TikTok series to you. Yes, TikTok series because creators on TikTok that make money, I mean, and they make a lot of money, y'all. Um, they have scripts, they plan their shots, they think about their music, and they decide what text they're going to put on the screen. And it's way more intense of planning and synthesizing information. And then they really have to practice taking all this information and synthesizing it down into a one minute TikTok. And I would do a series of TikToks um, on a topic that they would have to share. So that's my idea. <laughs> Love it. Okay, so to wrap up, we kind of have some key ideas or themes that we noticed that we just wanted to hit again. So the first thing is you want to make sure that every text you choose as a mentor text and the activities that you're doing, the writing activities have a purpose and you know uh, what that is and can convey it to students. 
And then I think with the purpose, um, these kind of go hand in hand is identifying that main skill for that writing. And so for, for the purposes of today, we talked about the main skill is summary. These, the kids are going to be able to summarize and then they're going to be able to create their own content that can then be summarized. So identify that core base skill. Next, we want to immerse students in text that use that skill. So go out and find those texts and just, I think exposure is everything, right? Get them to read a wide variety of texts that have that skill in them. And if you go back, uh, don't you don't need to put the slides back, but if you were to go back, you could see that we have the, um, the there are some resources. So on the infographic, it links out to a bunch of other infographics or small pieces students can use there. Leslie showed the Newzella piece, um, and I know in the maps, there are Newzella pieces in there as well. Um, so you don't have to necessarily do all this and find those uh, texts to immerse them in yourself reach out and we can share um, ones that we found or use each other to just share what other people are finding in their classrooms. Yeah, definitely. I love, okay, so I love the, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, you take that one. You take it. <laughs> I, I love this um, where it's to stop and notice the writing moves and techniques and to do it frequently. Um, and I know in the last Bite Size PD, Heike talked about this where she said, um, when reading John Krakauer, there's a couple sentences in there where she just really, the way he captures what he says, she pauses and takes time not to talk about the story, but to talk about how he's using the language and what he's doing by using that language. And so I think a lot of points of stopping and doing that with students and letting them see it and letting them keep an anchor chart somewhere or something in their writing notebook that Oh, I just did the next one. My bad. Something in the writing notebooks to save those moves is a really powerful tool. Yeah, that they can go back to later. And it could even be a journal spark, you know, write like one of your writers, you know, using that. Um, another thing is to provide plenty of opportunities for students to collaborate. Scott talked about this, but writing, real world writing is not independent. And I think about even like Scott and I sat and planned this PD together and we were writing slides and we were editing slides together. If when our students graduate and go into college and do research, they're usually on research teams and in jobs, you're on a team. And so collaborative writing is a real world skill that they need to learn. And then I think we, we can't do this enough. Um, and it's modeling our writing with students right in front of them. Show up, show them where we struggle. Um, show them where we've revised. Uh, explain with a think aloud why we're doing the kinds of thinking that we're thinking. And I think I just stole the next one too, Leslie. My okay. <laughs> but just really <laughs> sort of getting getting meta, getting uh, making your making your meta visible for your students to see. Um, so they see that writing doesn't just like come out of a pen, you know, there's a lot, it's a mess and you get it out there and then you, you tease it until it, it does what you want it to do. Yeah. And I think it, re we've talked about this a lot, but reinforcing that writing's a process and that it's okay to make mistakes it's, and it's okay to be vulnerable. Um, that's yeah. how we're going to get better. Well, think about today, even with our where you were talking about opportunities to collaborate. I mean, I think we're so used to working together that the vulnerability is super easy. Like, hey, Leslie, what if I do it this way? Oh, yeah, okay, but what if I do it this way? Okay, cool. And you know, we kind of both tinker it until it's better because we both actually worked on it together. Yep, yep. And diff just different perspectives, right? Make mm -hmm. things better. Yeah. All right, okay. Thanks for being here. Remember, get credit for this. And of course, as always, reach out to me and Scott if you have questions, if you want to try something out, if you need help or resources, we are here for you. Sounds good. Right. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.